Good evening, alumni, students, prospective students, colleagues, Gavin, Elena. I am Professor Jason Sturgis. I am the head of the School of Economics and Finance in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. It's my great pleasure this evening to welcome all of you to Queen Mary University of London. This evening will also be uh, live streamed, so delighted also to welcome all of you online. It would also be recorded and distributed more broadly to our 220,000 alumni globally. I'm especially delighted to welcome back our alumni. Our alumni are our greatest ambassadors. The achievements you make that have impact on economies and societies around the world not only strengthen our community, but also enhance our reputation. This evening's event the Alumni Angles is a particularly special event where we celebrate our alumni with achievements that not only resonate with the education and research at Queen Mary University of London, but also align with our values. This evening, it's an absolute delight to welcome back Gavin Lewis. Gavin studied history and politics, graduating in 2020, and I'm very much looking forward to him talking about his time here at QM, his career, and his book, The Opportunity Index. I would now like to invite Dr. Elena Dolder, leader in organizational behavior and co-director for the Center for Research in Equality and Diversity to introduce Kevin and kick off the event. Elena. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to Queen Mary, whether in person or online. Um, I'm Elena Doldor. I'm Director for Research Impact in our School of Business and Management, and also um, co-director for one of our research centers in equality and diversity. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to host this event and introduce to you Gavin, uh, who's a senior business executive with extensive experience in the finance industry, having worked for organizations such as Russell Investments, UBS, Vanguard Europe, and BlackRock. Um, he's co-founder of the Talk About Black movement, which highlights the challenges black professionals face in the industry, the finance industry, and society at large, and also founder of the I Am campaign, um, he's passionate about diversifying the finance industry, and I guess he poured that passion into writing this great book called The Opportunity Index, a solution-based framework to dismantle the racial wealth gap. Um, the book explores uh, the economics of inequality through Gavin's um, professional and personal experience. I think it does a fantastic job of situating um, his um, career trajectory into the broader societal and political and economic context um, it's really a powerful and necessary book, and I would warmly recommend uh, it to everyone. So there are two reasons I'm particularly excited to um, have this conversation with Gavin tonight. One is because I'm personally um, interested in, in issues of diversity and leadership, and I've researched, published, and taught about these topics for the last 15 years. Uh, my research broadly looks at why ethnic minorities and women uh, get to the top in leadership roles and why they have or not, <laughs> and why they have different experiences as leaders. Um, and I'm also a firm believer that um, social science and research should be societally useful, so I'm keen to always speak to leaders, speak to organizations and policymakers about how we can make a change. Um, the second reason is that my interest is by no means unique to Queen Mary. Uh, just within the business school, we have an entire research center of over 30 academics and PhD students who do work on workplace equality, um, and more broadly, as a university, we are unapologetic in uh, our commitment to social justice, equality, and inclusion. Um, and we pride ourselves in being the most inclusive Russell Group University um, and the best university in the country for social mobility. So we want to connect to our alumni, of course, but we also want to do so in a way that speaks to our core values as a university. And I think tonight's event is a perfect example of that. We have almost one hour for the conversation with Gavin, which includes a Q&A segment at the end. Uh, I should also say that we received already many questions online, which I will weave through our discussion and conversation. Um, so I'm going to join Gavin now. Gavin, thank 
you so much for being here with us. Um, I want to begin with a broad question, particularly in light of your book. Can you tell us a bit about your upbringing and what got you to university here at Queen Mary? Sure, happy to. And uh, thank you very much for obviously inviting me to talk and come in to listen. Um, just one point, I didn't graduate in 2020, which is what Jason said. <laughs> you must be thinking, wow, this guy's had a hard life, because he's only, <laughs> he's only 24, and he looks like he's 44. So, uh, uh, but well done for spotting the deliberate error there to keep you awake. So um, I graduated in 2000, and uh, I have to say, like, I was walking along. I came out of Mylan Tube, and I was walking along. This place has changed significantly. And it wasn't as diverse mm. then as it is now, I, I have to say. Uh, and there were literally no shops on the Mile End. There wasn't anything on the Mile End Road. It's like a desert that you walk down before you get to the tube. So um, it's changed a lot. Uh, but, but to answer the question, so my so my upbringing. So I um, so I was born uh, and raised in Tottenham, uh, in uh, inner city London, which some of you may uh, may know. Uh, to uh, Caribbean parents, um, my mum is uh, from Jamaica and she arrived here in uh, 1967 which was for obviously there might be some history and politics students here which you know was a pivotal year uh, 1967 1968 socially economically um, Enoch Powell's rivers of blood speech obviously the death of Martin Luther King the rise of the political left and she arrived here in amongst um, that period. Uh, I never knew my father, so he left uh, us when uh, I was very, very young. Uh, I do have a sister uh, who was born two years before me, and she's obviously two years older than, older than I am. And we grew up in uh, council accommodation in Tottenham. And <clears throat> I guess I was uh, subject to uh, a lot of the challenges that young black men and boys faced and still face today. Uh, just a disclaimer. So when I talk about my experience in Tottenham, it's just my experience. Uh, often when I do these talks, someone comes up to me and, and has a go at me and wags a finger and says, you shouldn't talk about Tottenham like that. And it's not because I'm an Arsenal fan. It's just because my, my, experience, in, my experience growing up in Tottenham was, was, was difficult. And although others may have had a very, very different experience, and which could have been a positive experience, um, I found myself uh, often in fights, uh, in altercations. Uh, I was always having run-ins with the police. I saw and was party to, unfortunately, a lot of violence. And uh, I know we often tend to talk about this and gloss over it, but a lot of the young people that I work with and mentor back in Tottenham, uh, this is still going on. And I don't feel the situation has improved at all. In fact, I feel it's gotten worse. Uh, my mum uh, was fully aware of this. Interestingly, my sister uh, managed to navigate her time in Tottenham much easier than I did. For some reason, I seem to be a magnet for trouble. Uh, writing the book was really interesting because it made me go back and speak to my mum about that period. And she actually challenged me on some of the uh, memories that I had, because actually when we first arrived in the council accommodation and when I was much younger in Tottenham, it was, it was a really nice place to live because the council state was really new, um, there was a sense of community, it was only really when I got older that I started to fall victim to some of the violence. So she um, took issue with this and decided to do something about it. Uh, Interestingly, again, we often talk about the educational attainment of um, young black boys. I have to say now that dialogue has then shifted to talk about just young boys in general and also young white males. And I think we have to assess why many have and are still underachieving in, in education. I'd also say another disclaimer here that the black community is not monolithic. So again, someone always comes up to me and wags a finger and says, you know, Actually, the educate, educate, uh, sorry, educational attainment of uh, West Africans versus Caribbeans, there is a difference. But I do think we need to look and examine why that is. And maybe you could have a lecture, a whole lecture on that um, sure. in, in of itself. 
So again, there is a, there is a, a, a difference. At that point, in the 1980s and 70s, we're predominantly talking about young um, Caribbean boys and girls. And the, for some reason, they were often being excluded from schools. And I was one of those kids that was on the verge of being excluded from school. Uh, uh, then there were these um, special units called um, uh, ESN schools. And ESN schools, ESN is an acronym for educationally subnormal. And what occurred is that many young black um, boys and girls at that time, predominantly from the Caribbean, who'd arrived, so first generation, uh, were not performing in the same way that their white peers were. And schools often assumed that they didn't have the mental capacity or cognition to deal with the academic requirements for school children at that time. I was one of those kids and I was on the, being the verge of sent, being sent to an ESN school. Um, some of my friends were and did at the time and I can tell you now that none of them have fulfilled their potential in life. Um, many uh, are not here anymore uh, and many are in mental, in mental um, institutions or were sectioned. Uh, my mum took issue with this and decided to send me to a school outside of Tottenham. Uh, at that time, there was a lady called Stella Dadzi, who was, and Stella is still um, here and still around, and she was giving advice and encouragement to women to empower themselves. There was also a chap, a, name, a chap called Dennis Cord, and Dennis wrote about the challenges of educational attainment in um, inner city schools, not just in London, but in Birmingham and other places in Manchester where other black kids lived. And he said, actually, you should challenge the schools because maybe they've got it wrong. So my mum sent me out of the school to school in Enfield. And lo and behold, I flourished. And that's a whole discussion around why, and probably too much for now. I'm happy to talk about it in, in the Q&A. What she didn't know is that sending me to a school out of Tottenham was great for my education. Um, but I was then in a very, very different demographic. So. Uh, Enfield, where she sent me at that time, it's changed a lot now, but at that time, it was a predominantly white, um, po predominantly poor, particularly this area that I was being sent to, working class um, demographic. And they did not take kindly to this black kid turning up to their school. Uh, and interestingly, there were a bunch of other parents who fought the same way. So there may be about maybe 10 of us traveling up to the school out of Tottenham to Enfield. Um, and uh, arrived at the school, uh, which was, we didn't know, but was a um, enclave for the National Front. So for the youngsters in the audience, the English Defence League, you know, we branded themselves, obviously got good marketing. Uh, they were then called the National Front, and that's the school that I ended up in. So this very, very weird experience of having fights in Tottenham, having this period of quiet on the bus, and then ended up fighting racists in, in Enfield. I would say, however, um, and we'll talk about obviously my experience at university and in, in finance, there was always this sense of not really being connected to any particular community because I thought I was always wired a little bit differently from my peers in Tottenham, certainly wired differently to the kids I went to school with in, in Enfield. So I didn't really belong, didn't really fit in. Uh, that was difficult as a young person because you are all and will be, would be insecure. It's now what I think a superpower, if you want to talk about leadership, but obviously we can talk about that a bit later. How I ended up at um, Queen Mary, I had the opportunity because I was in a different environment to really focus academically. So I've got good GCSEs, much better A-level, so A's at, uh, A's at A-level, uh, and felt that I really had a shot to do something. Now, there are now um, plenty of young kids from disadvantaged areas who excel academically. Uh, so again, I just want to dispel a myth that it was an anomaly. However, at that point, uh, there was no social media, there was certainly no LinkedIn, and there was a black newspaper called The Voice. It was such a big deal. They ran my story and my, pa my face in that paper for months. Like, honestly, my mum's still got the collection of The Voice newspapers at home. Uh, because it was so rare to see black achievement and then to actually discuss it and um, support it. That has changed a lot now. Uh, I had the option then obviously to go to university and, 
I can talk about why I selected Queen Mary, but um, it was an opportunity to make a difference to my life, um, and I took it. I think it's so powerful. You know, your life story um, really kind of brings to life a lot of the, the, the stats we often share about our university in terms of what's the profile of our students, in particular the London domestic undergraduate students um, who come to us. 93% of them are from state school, 71% are black and minority ethnic, 41% are the first, 47% uh, sorry, the first who uh, go into higher education from their families. Um, so, you know, those are quite important stats to sort of think about, but also to connect to a life story like yours. Um, so I suppose coming to getting to your experience here at Queen Mary, you know, what difference did that make to you? You speak in your book about education as an escape from your circumstances quite a lot. Can you tell us about the uh, difference that going to Queen Mary made to you? Sure. So, um, so when I got my A-levels, it was... Uh, I thought I would do well, but I didn't think I'd get like A's. Uh, and I have to say, it emotionally took a lot out of me. And I was, I have to say, a little bit fearful of what I would do next. And my, um, my teachers were encouraging me and saying, you should apply to go to Oxford and Cambridge. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll do so well there. And, uh, so you have to understand that the context that I was operating in is that I was already feeling mm. different. Then I got these grades. Uh, and there really wasn't a community that I felt that I fitted in. And I did visit many universities. <clears throat> and I have to say that I, didn't, I couldn't envision myself there uh, because there was no one there that, very few people that looked like me, sounded like me, that was from my background. Um, when, and I have to say, I don't know if I should have looked at the stats, but again, Queen Mary certainly was not as diverse as it is now. I think those stats are certainly less um, than you've quoted, Eleanor. Uh, but it felt like home, I have to say. Queen Mary felt like a place where I could go and be my, myself without having to compromise on um, the quality of the, of the university. Uh, interestingly, I also decided to stay at home. Uh, so in London, I didn't move out. I stayed at home and went to university. I, I do think back on some of those decisions and feel vindicated in the decisions that I did that I did make. But I do also wonder what life would have been like had I had moved out and had the full university experience. However, there is... Uh, <laughs> We talk about like limiting beliefs, and perhaps limiting beliefs are that in a different environment I couldn't I couldn't flourish, and there's a reason why I work in finance and try and have targeted to forge a career at the largest global firms because it's my way of eradicating those limiting beliefs. But there is also an economic component to this as well, and the thought and the prospect of incurring debt that I might not be able to pay back was really, really difficult for me to quantum. So I do a lot of work with young people, and even in my naivety. So I had the, um, and please don't hate me for this, but when I was at, when I went to university, you got something called a grant. Uh, like, a grant, you say? Yes, a grant. Like, the, the government gave you money to go to university. I know it's much, you know, it's much, so when you go home, ask your parents, like, what the hell is this grant thing? Uh, they'll know. And, um, uh, it, and I worked in a supermarket uh, in Sainsbury's in Muswell Hill uh, in Northland to pay to help me and pay my way. And uh, my mum started charging me rent, which was a bit like, you know, <laughs> it happens when you've got Caribbean parents. Uh, she's like, if you're working, then you can contribute. So, um, uh, but so the thought of, of going to university and getting in debt was difficult for me because um, we didn't have money growing up. And I saw my mum really struggle. She put herself through university but had to pay her own way. It meant that she wasn't working. It was very inspirational to see my mum working late into the night studying at Middlesex, poly as it was, polytechnic as it was then. Uh, but it did make me very fearful about not having money. And it, that, I have to say, has also uh, influenced the decisions I've made in terms of my career. Uh, so, of course, 
I love numbers, I love the intellectual challenge of working in finance, but you do get economically rewarded for it. And mm -hmm. that financial security or the achievement of it was certainly for me a huge driver for many of the decisions that I make. So yes, there is discussions around aspiration and beliefs, but we also have to figure out what the economic impediments are as well. Yeah, and I think you, you make a strong case about why the economic aspect of inequality matters so much, in addition to the social and cultural um, aspects of it. Um, so you know, let's get to that point of you deciding to go into finance, because you graduated from history and politics. You talk in the book about how you worked in recruitment before you moved in the finance industry. So based on this experience, what advice do you have for um, students and alumni about transferable skills? Any thoughts on that? Of course. Uh, so I, I do feel that the, the options and the access and the avenues open to students now are much greater than they were when I, when I graduated. So you can go on LinkedIn, build a profile, and send a message directly to a banker that's what you want to do, or a chemist, or a scientist, uh, or someone works in engineering. You have the ability to do that. That wasn't the case when I um, graduated. There was electricity, and there were, there, the internet <laughs> did exist, by the way. It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't 2020. Uh, uh, but the ability to actually identify the career that you want to do was so much less than, than it is now. Uh, I also was very naive. I thought that if I go to university and get a good degree and then apply for jobs, then I'd stand a chance. The concept of work experience, even like the grad recruitment cycles and when to apply, lost on me. Didn't have a clue, had no idea. So I graduated, then had to print my CV, put it in an envelope and send it in the post, and did this for what felt like a long time. It probably wasn't, but it felt like a long time. Because I'd seen my... Um, mum graduated from university and struggled to find the right job. I saw my sister graduate and struggled to find the right job. So I had the same fear. Uh, I did get interviews with um, some of the investment banks. And uh, they, so I don't know if anyone's gone through this process, they still exist today, but it is like a boot camp where they bring, like it's a room like this, but just much bigger. And you've got to sit like a psychometric test, and they take you into another room, and you've got to do some group exercises. And it is literally like Hunger Games uh, for, you know, like, for students to get through, and if you happen to get through. Um, and I, I actually did well in, in those things. Um, where I fell down was at the interview stage, because a lot of them couldn't get their head around. Well, firstly, I was the only black person there. There's no clue in the name Gavin Lewis that I'd be of Caribbean heritage. Right, so it'd often be like, well, you know, Gavin is well, I think Welsh and Scottish, right? So they're probably expecting someone of a very, very different profile to what you see here. And I remember I'd, they'd look at Gavin Lewis and I'd stand up and they'd look right past me and do a double take because it just was so rare at the time. Um, and at the interview stage, very often they would say, like, we don't understand. Well, when you compare to other candidates, we don't understand why you haven't done anything because you've worked at Sainsbury's, whereas um, Tarquin, sorry if anyone's called Tarquin, <laughs> or Rupert, apologies if anyone's called Rupert, they went to uh, you know, Rwanda and built a well. That was actually said to me. Um, uh, and all you've done is work at Sainsbury's. Not really actually understanding that the context for this is that economic impediment and actually working to put yourself through university and paying your way versus the ability to think, you know what, it doesn't matter if I get a job when I come back or not, I'm going to do this thing, was valued much greater. Um, so I couldn't get in. So I ended up working in recruitment thinking that actually if I get proximity to the, to the industry, maybe it might give me the experience that I, that I need. Um, five years into that career, <laughs> wasn't the plan, but five years into that career, it felt like, okay, I'm not sure how much more I'm going to get from this. Uh, I, at that point, started recruiting salespeople into, or client or business people into this really weird part of the industry called hedge funds. Uh, and no one knew what these things were, but I just managed to find some of these, like, at that time, like weird and wonderful companies who were based in like houses in Mayfair, which is very odd. And I started placing 
salespeople into these companies and they were earning a fortune, but they were no better than I was, mm. I felt. So um, I took the decision to leave recruitment and try to get into at least that transferable skill into finance. Uh, it was difficult. So uh, again, at that point, I, although I had the, the transferable skills, I wasn't a finance professional. Uh, I also still didn't, certainly didn't fit the demographic of the people that I was meeting. Uh, however, I did find a really small startup um, that was run by uh, four uh, like much more experienced and older white guys, and they needed someone to come in and do a lot of the stuff that they didn't really want to do, but it was amazing for me because it allowed me to really learn from four people that had been in the industry for a very, very long period of time, and I was like a sponge. Um, from there, uh, I then um, went to my work at a much larger firm, Russell, because by then I had the experience, uh, and obviously Vanguard, and then my, my current firm, BlackRock. I work in a part of the industry called pension investments, which I know sounds incredibly exciting, uh, but it's a huge, huge part of the industry which very few people know about. The challenge that I had there, again, is that um, certainly now for many graduates, uh, there are initiatives and there are programs that allow you to actually get the experience to go into these firms. And I would say that if you are a student and you're thinking about it, absolutely take advantage of them because they can often level the playing field. But because there was nothing like that when I first graduated, the numbers of senior black professionals, men and women, are very, very, very small, like incredibly small. So I could probably count on maybe two hands. And this isn't just in asset management, across banking, professional services, um, and the legal profession, just how many senior people there are. And often we bring them into rooms like this, and it feels like there are a lot. But when you disperse them amongst the industry, they are often the only one at their level in their company, in their business. Uh, and that's because of the, the inability for black students and other minorities, of course, to access them at that, at that entry point. Final thing I would say here, however, is on the idea of transferable skills, it isn't just about what one, isn't just about what, what one has done in their job. I feel that I have then caught up and probably surpassed um, where others uh, probably saw me simply because of all the experience that we've talked about. Because the world has changed, it's incredibly uncertain, and what made one or a business successful in the last 10, 20 years is not what's gonna make business successful in the next 20 years. And a different approach and perspective is required. What I do feel that I've developed um, because of the experiences that I've had is that ability to look and think somewhat differently. So it is attributes such as resilience, um, which we often talk about, grit, determination, and work ethic. I think we, um, if you've been and faced adversity, we are much more than that. There's this idea of conceptual thinking and a growth mindset. Because if you've had to navigate, even if like, your story is similar to mine, if you have to navigate that environment to get to this point, then you'll have those attributes in spades. And from my perspective, it's what allows people to excel in the workplace. Okay. It's such a good metaphor for sort of how you, you see your journey as a resource rather than a, a, a challenge. Um, we've had a lot of questions about uh, advice uh, on how to get in the finance industry specifically. Are there any uh, tips you want to give um, students here on breaking into that industry or potentially transitioning from other industries like healthcare into that? Yeah, so I think there is a view that maybe still pervades that to work in finance, you need to have a maths or engineering or physics or science degree. Well, clearly you don't because I have an arts degree. And, you know, these are businesses. So the same functions that exist in other firms, let's just say a FMCG, fast moving consumer goods company, would exist in finance. So. Yes, some people do invest money and a, a particular skill set may be required. But around that, you then have um, people who are marketeers, um, people who work in technology, uh, people who work in the digital world, people like me who manage and deal with 
clients and actually different skill sets and attributes are required. Mm. So I would say, I just want to dispel the myth that you need a maths degree, for example, to work in finance. The, the other thing is that I, I do think the industry it has looked at itself and realized that it's tended to hire from the same backgrounds and the same schools and the same disciplines, which is not, does not afford diversity with a small d. So there's been a concerted effort to actually bring people in, for example, with different backgrounds and different um, qualifications. So that has definitely been a theme. And, the, and certainly I can see, I've seen industry really targeting arts degrees or people with different experiences. Um, then on things like um, different experiences. So um, there are so many examples here. So many firms have, for example, athletes programs where they take on former professional athletes because those athletes will have the attributes necessary to survive in what can be very demanding and high performance cultures. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, many firms have a military vets, military vets programs as well. I don't know if anyone's ever worked with a military vet, but they are brilliant because you, like, you know, for us, oh my God, there's a crisis. For them, they're like, well, there are no bullets flying over my head, so, you know, just relax, and they just get it done. They are amazing. And Things into brilliant. Like, absolutely, exactly. So, um, like, amazing attributes. And then you think about things like healthcare. So, many firms now invest in healthcare technology or healthcare itself. And many firms will say, well, actually, if we're going to analyze um, healthcare companies, who better than someone's actually worked in that industry? Another example might be um, this part of the industry, which some of you might have heard of, called private markets. So these are things like infrastructure, real estate. So here, investment firms will be building physical um, assets and investing in them to produce return for investors. So these might be things such as wind farms um, or commercial real estate. For that, you would need, for example, scientists, someone that's built wind turbines, geologists, um, surveyors. None of those are traditional finance um, qualifications, but they are absolutely transferable because the industry really has changed and evolved mm -hmm. uh, to warrant and need those, need those skills. Yeah. We have to talk about two types of diversity at work. Diversity in terms of demographic diversity. We want people of different ethnicities, genders, etc., but also diversity of thought, of skill, of perspective. The two are interrelated, but they're not always the same. And you know what you speak about is both of them there. Um, that's great. So moving on to um, kind of how you transition from taking on these roles in the finance industry and sort of progressing into leadership roles, um, how did you go about honing in those leadership skills? What does it take to develop those um, at entry or mid-career level? So I, um, I don't know how well companies actually produce good leaders. Uh, often it's an uh, afterthought, and often you'll find that companies, be them law firms or professional services firms or asset managers, it, it, it's, you know, but even in, in the public sector, it, it happens as well. N normally what I think happens is someone's very, very good at their job, at delivering on their job, and then the way to promote them is to, well, you know, have some people reporting into you. Now you're a manager. And so that's one way of doing it. Um, another way of doing it is actually thinking, separating this idea on concepts of management and leadership. So leadership is, management is the physical act of an appraisal or setting tasks and responsibilities. Leadership is very, very different and leadership is a vocation um, and it's a real skill. Uh, my view is that any skill can be developed, but I do think one has to be intentional about leadership both from the firm and firms and how they produce leaders, but also leaders and how they actually carry out that responsibility, because it is the biggest responsibility that you can have in the corporate, in the corporate world. That is, you are now responsible for the careers and the experiences that your greatest assets people have in those organizations. Uh, I was at a crossroads where I could have continued uh, being 
what we call a, an individual contributor, so someone who doesn't manage people or lead people, um, and or moving into a leadership role. I felt that uh, I know what I'm like. I get bored very, very quickly. I'm very intellectual, which is a, something that I'm working on. Uh, I'm very intellectually curious, and the, the idea, and I, I felt that I'd had to be a leader just to do things differently from the experiences that we talked about earlier, and that I felt that I'd had to be a leader and do things differently and set my own targets, set my own benchmarks. So I've been doing that for myself. Uh, and I think the key thing for me is that if I'd have listened to be it school teachers uh, or even people that I might have worked with that's told me what my potential is, I would not be where I am today. So I had to set my own benchmark and set my own aspirations and realize and, and project my potential, which I felt was much greater than other people often afforded me. Uh, and that was transformational for me. I didn't realize it at the time, but it, 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 it was. And I felt that that's something that I could do for other people. So I made a decision to move into a leadership role, and it's something that I take very, very seriously. I uh, can be a little, I can make people feel uncomfortable because my view is that I, my view is often that people's potential is much greater than they realize. And I feel it's my responsibility to help them mm -hmm. realize that potential. <laughs> I do realize that not everyone wants to realize their potential as well. Though, so <laughs> like, like, leave me alone. Uh, but, uh, but that's the way that I've had to manage myself and my career. And I, you know, if there is a, and you would have know this much better than I would, and then a, there are different models and concepts of leadership, and there are different styles of leadership. And if I was to put myself in that textbook definition, it would be transformational leadership, because I've constantly felt that I've had to change myself, the organisation that I've worked in, uh, and people and teams. And that's what I do. That's what you know gets me going. Is say, right, there's a problem. Can you fix it? Can you change things? Um, I would also say, however, that uh, it's a constant and assessing how you have failed as a leader is as important to thinking about your, your successes. And you will get things wrong. Uh, <clears throat> and it's incredibly lonely because I, the further you get in your career and the more senior you become, now I have a team of 30 odd people who sit around me, but I am the one they're looking to. And that only gets magnified the further up you go. I would also say that as a minority, that journey is also lonelier because mm -hmm. your peer group probably doesn't look like you. When you're in a leadership position, everything you do is magnified and examined to a much greater degree. And the ability to fail is a lot less that is only ramped up when you're a black man or a black woman or an Asian man or an, or an Asian woman. So the stakes are often higher. People think it gets easier. I think your ability to manage it might improve, but I would say it's probably more challenging. Totally. I think, you know, um, um, one, there's a paradox there, right, that what takes you to leadership roles is not what makes you successful in those roles. I often tell students that, you know, it's not the knowledge or it's, it's, it's the other sort of bigger skills of managing people, having a vision, um, managing the politics oftentimes, right? Um, so let's talk about the, this last few um, things you've mentioned, which is, you know, being in those leadership spaces as a minority. What are the particular, and leadership is challenging to begin with, as you well pointed out, but what are the particular challenges um, you faced as a minority ethnic professional here? A lot of the questions online were about this, and, and what are the unique obstacles that ethnic minority professionals face? Yeah, so, um, so I think there are, like in, in the US, there was like a lot of, I mean, I'm sure you would have you've probably produced some of the work that I'm about to quote, um, I don't know, but for many black professionals, I think we have to ask, ask ourselves why, for example, in the UK, maybe someone could correct me, no, but there still isn't a black 
CEO of FTSE 100 or 250 or 350. No one's correcting me. So, ah, there is one, maybe. There was. Potential, but is there now? No, okay, well, okay, fair enough. So, <laughs> so I, was, I don't mean to be so dismissive, but there isn't now, right? Um, so we have to ask ourselves why that, is the, why that is the case. Is it ability, or is there something else going on? In the, uh, in the US, uh, papers have been written about this, and there is the concept of diminishing returns. And that is, for many black professionals, they often find themselves, the further they go, the rewards get less given the energy and emotional tax that it takes to get there and stay and stay there, and many opt out. A study was done on um, senior black uh, women professionals, and uh, the, the term used was the glass um, cliff, and I'm sure you've heard of this, and it doesn't just apply to black women, but the study was done on, on black women and saying that they are often um, brought in in the midst of a crisis, given the hardest jobs. Uh, often they are treated as a, you know, for the hiring manager, my prized possession, and that's great until it, the project doesn't work or they don't, they forget their place and they demand more and ask more and suddenly they're prior and then out they go. Uh, so I think we have to ask ourselves why this is the, is the case, because is it ability, or is there something else going on? Um, I, and I, to, my view is that if you, for the few that do get there and stay there, like you are elite, and we are, I tell you what black people have done who are in the UK, we've taken on the British, like, you know, humility, but if you are a black professional, and you've managed to get to the top of one of these firms, you are elite. Uh, and that is elite performance, because these are high-performing cultures, and we often don't talk about what it takes for, to be elite. Now, if you are a, um, so I'm an Arsenal fan, and uh, if I haven't told you that already, uh, and we're doing really well at the moment, in case, in case anyone hasn't noticed. So, um, if you look at what uh, professional footballers get in terms of what's put around them, so they are elite athletes, and they have medical staff on hand, they have physios, they're told what to eat, they're told when to turn up, any niggle gets treated immediately. Um, but when you're an elite like professional, there's none of that around you. And my view is that if you are going to operate in that environment, you need to treat yourself and live as an elite corporate athlete. So, uh, and it's something that I, because of the, the tax is so great. So something that I pay particular attention to. So I have a coach. Um, I should also say I have my wife, who's the first and most important person, and then my mum, who's the second, and my daughters, so before they have a go at me for not mentioning them. Uh, so outside of that support network, uh, I have a coach. Um, I have to, you know, have to make sure that, because the work is so demanding, and I have this additional responsibility of doing things like this, that I get enough sleep. Uh, these are small things. I have to make sure that I'm eating well, that my nutrition, I get my health check every single year. I work out like five, six times a week. Um, so I, my whole existence, mm. I found to operate at this level, has to be wired and tuned into achieving and operating at what is very rarefied air. Even for a white professional, it's difficult. So for us, it's that much harder. Uh, but. I don't think that is necessary. I don't think that is necessary. It shouldn't take this extra effort to survive at that level, but it does because it is that much harder. Mm -hmm. So that was my question. I, I get your uh, analogy, athletic analogy, but is the race different? You know, for 
somebody running the race, so to speak, with a minoritized background. And in your book, you speak quite a lot about, actually, you write something very powerful about fending off casual racism had almost become a skill, right? So as a leader, you either ignore it, make light of it, confront it, but you have to be choosy about which ones you apply. And so, you know, how do you navigate the situations at work that don't just challenge you as a leader, but as a minoritized one? Yeah, so I, uh, it's an interesting question. Because I think if you've been operating in that corporate world and you've managed to get to a senior position, you've probably figured a lot out. Uh, so I'm, and if you had a black woman sitting in a seat, she would give you a slightly different answer. But as a black man, you know, I'm six foot three, so I'm tall. And uh, uh, I can't, whether I like it or not, some people might find me intimidating. So I have to be very, very cognizant of my body language and how I treat people, how I interact with people. Uh, off, you know, on the dress down days at work, this is me dressing down because I can't afford to wear ripped jeans and trainers because people might not take me as seriously. As others. So, there was this constant need to watch and be mindful of who you are and how people treat you. Uh, so I am the, always, the first person to greet everyone, to smile, to be, because there's an element of having to diffuse those stereotypes that come to the, come to the fore before, before the, those stereotypes were actually manifested. Now, there's a term for this, it's called covering. And for, if you've been in the industry for a long time, it probably is second nature. Uh, it probably is second nature to me now, don't really think about it, but there was still tax on that of having to, before I react to this, how am I going to be seen? How am I going to be treated? How is this going to be received? What is the perception of me going to be? Other people do not have that challenge and don't even have to think about it. Uh, then there is, as, as I said in the book, the fact that I think there is a view that when you get to a senior position, like incidents don't happen or that might you know, be linked to your race. They do, and they will. Uh, and I think you then have to make a decision around, okay, so am I gonna confront this, or am I gonna let this go? But the other challenge that you have is, you are one, often one of the only senior black professionals in the industry, not just in one's firm, but in the industry, and anyone that has experienced something, they want time in your diary and they want a coffee. So you then take on the other issues that people have and you then have to think about what advice do I give this person? Do I do something about this? But also, you need to protect yourself. So do I actually meet this person for a coffee? Because the emotional drain, not to mention the physical drain, is incredibly hard. Um, and this is the whole point about being an athlete because all this drains your gas tank. And if my coach is watching, he's going to be like, you do this so badly, so why are you talking about it? Like, you do this so well. <laughs> anyway, all this, uh, <laughs> what if he's, he ever gets in? All this drains your gas tank, so what are you doing to replenish it? And sometimes it might be actually saying no to those. But it's hard because you have this responsibility that you feel to this young person that's facing a challenge, and just you're it, you know? Right. So um, I would also say that you know, to get, the, the more senior you get, the fewer seats there are. Yeah. And the more competition for those seats there are. Yeah. Uh, so what is your strategy? What is your brand? What is your profile? That needs to be managed as carefully as how you do your job, what results you have. Okay. But when you have this other layer of being a black professional, mm. you have to think about that even more acutely. And the brain space and emotional space that it takes up is significant. It's not insurmountable, it's just harder. Oh, I hear you. Um, so, you know, you've written this book where you, you talk about a lot of these issues in the book, in, in wrapping up the conversation, because I'm gonna open it up soon to, to um, questions. What drove you to write the book? What do you want the impact of the book to be? And sort of, where do you see the hope in, um, in diversifying leadership, more broadly speaking? So as you can see from my uh, journey, you know, I've existed in some very different 
worlds. And my main drive and motivation initially was, was about personal achievement and growth, but honestly, also about financial security. That was a huge driver for me. After I got to, of course, you know, describe senior, after I got to a senior position, uh, you realize, okay, well, you know what, I can afford to pay my bills and, you know, I'm not going to be destitute, so I can probably, you know, and then you look up and you look around you and you wonder why you're the only, or one of very, very few black people in the, um, at your position or, or, or in the industry, and you ask yourself why. For my view is that the discussions are always around the social impediments to progress or inequality, so it's often, the discussions are often about how the school teacher treats, I know all of this I've talked about, right, but it's how the school teacher treats you, it's how the judicial system treats you, it's how you experience with, in, with healthcare. It might be that the fact that you can't get a job or that there's a, a pay gap. And um, to my mind, those are social challenges which explain part of the um, equation. So we talk about some of the social economic disadvantage. What we really talk about is social disadvantage because we forgot, we've forgotten about the economic aspect. What disadvantage really means is poor life outcomes, but we never quantify it. So disadvantage really means lower educational attainment, poorer health um, care or, or life and or life expectancy, <laughs> Um, lower paid jobs, poor housing, etc. But I, con I couldn't fathom why those poor life outcomes are purely linked to the social element. Uh, I'm a business person, I'm not a DEI person at all. There are plenty of people who do that job and are far more familiar with diversity, equity, inclusion solutions than, than I am. So what I did is tackle the issue from a business perspective. And I began to explore why we don't think about the economic aspect and what became very very clear to me is when we talk about for example educational attainment we often say it's the attitude of school teachers uh, or cult or when I was a kid the cultural challenges of educating young black boys and girls uh, but actually it could be as simple as access to good education it could just be the simplest access to knowledge it could be access to jobs uh, it could be access to promotion criteria and those are economic in nature. So I know because I see it, because now um, I earn a good living, I've got two daughters, their life chances are just simply better. Not because, so they're black women, they will be black women, so they're gonna have the same challenges, but economically they're in a very, very different situation because I, and by the way, you know, I'm still not you know, completely over this, but I sent them to private school, which was a massive ding-dong in my house about should they go to private school or not. But anyway, my wife won the argument, so they're in, private, they're in private school. And I see what they get in terms of the ethos, the access to it. You know, they're going to be okay. That's an economic issue. And the book is an attempt to dismantle the idea that everything that we face is a, is a social consequence and actually think about the economic consequences. Uh, what would I like it to do? Is to change the debate because we are still caught up in <clears throat> the politicization of DEI, them versus us. <clears throat> Perhaps if we took a more, and it's not to diminish the social aspects and how people feel. You know, I still get pulled over. Mm -hmm. you know, from driving my car or followed around the shop. But that doesn't determine my life outcomes. The economics do. And what would be great is actually we shifted the discussion to actually talk about this economic aspect and remove the emotive um, uh, them versus us discussions. I'm just a really poor marketer. I, you know, I was supposed to get books delivered here. I forgot about it till like last week. <laughs> Because my head is full of work stuff They're and blah, 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 blah. You're so, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd probably hire a marketing team, probably would be uh, the last bit of advice I give myself, anyway. Well, it's a very useful perspective to, to broaden the conversation and the analysis. I have a million other questions to ask you, but I'm going to stop here and give people the opportunity to um, ask some questions. I'm going to ask you to please uh, keep your questions brief and so we can get as many in as possible. Um, who would like to go first? Do we have a question there? Yeah.
Somebody's gonna come with a mic in a second. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us. Uh, the session was very insightful. And I want to ask, how do you manage your brand in the workplace? How do you make sure that you make the right connections internally within your company and also outside of your company to ensure that it's easier for you to make this transition if you need to at some point in your career? <clears throat> well, thank you for the question. And uh, it's rather patronizing. It's a really good one because I have to be honest, I didn't really, I kind of fell into my brand. I didn't really, uh, I don't have a team of people working on Gavin Lewis, the concept. It's like, I don't have one. Uh, I wish I did. Uh, but mine came out of a, just, a, I know I need to be brief, but. Um, when the Me Too movement happened, like it was, it transcended everything and affected my industry as much as it did others. But at the time, I didn't feel we were having the same discussion about uh, race and ethnicity. Um, I was asked to lead um, an initiative to bring it to the table, but my wife said, if you don't do it, no one else will. So I kind of fell into this, and uh, <laughs> because there wasn't anyone else. So, it, I wrote a blog, which, which was a recount of what we talked about here, which was growing up in Tottenham and the county of the state, mm. which at the time was a huge risk because I don't think anyone in finance, certainly in the UK, anyway, had done that, and it could have backfired. And in some respects, it probably did. Um, but it was a very authentic message that really resonated with people, because what I didn't do is say, you're right, you're right, and you're wrong. I said, this is my experience, uh, which people, even if they weren't black, often they could resonate with some aspects of it. Uh, so that became the beginning of my brand and my profile, as well as being good at my job. And somewhat reluctantly, believe it or not, but somewhat reluctantly, I've continued working to try and change things for other people. Uh, and for some reason, people have resonated with the message and what I've been trying to do. However, the more senior I got, the more that I realized that whenever I would do a talk like this or put something on social media, there was risk involved. And it's incumbent upon me to manage that risk. So the best way for me to manage that risk is think, okay, I have this profile now, actually what is my brand? How do I want to be seen, recognized? The interesting thing is that it's important for me at least to manage that uh, outside of the workplace as it is inside the workplace. And if I could boil it down to one thing, honestly, it's probably about your relationships with people because your brand basically is what people think, say, feel, and perceive of you. And the best way to influence that is how you treat them and what your relationship is. So I purposefully think that in every interaction that I'm having, after this interaction's finished, uh, because well, okay, in a pressurized environment, some of those can be very tense. Actually, what relationship will I have with this person after this? And I consciously manage my relationships and try to ensure that I've got good partnerships with as many people, whilst also being someone who advocates for change. And British people love the underdog, right? So, uh, so that resonates with, with people, um, I feel. But I would say it's only in the last probably period of my career that I've been managing that purposefully. I do say to people that it's so important. It is so important, uh, and I think the more senior you get, it's as you said, and it's not as it's not just how well you manage your team and how good you do your job. It's actually what people are saying about you when you're not in the room, and that is all to do with your brand and your profile. And if you don't manage it, others will manage it for you. Can we get two consecutive ones? Can we had one here and one there. Okay. Can we can we get two questions in so that you can answer them? Um, 
Hi, Gavin. Uh, my name is Lois. Thank you for sharing with us today. And my question is based on your experience as a young man. Um, you said that you didn't feel like you belonged where you lived and where you went to school when you were younger. As a former international student, I think I can relate to it after coming to the UK. So how were you able to navigate this if you did? And do you have any tips for people like me? Thank you. Thank you. Let me get another one here and then I'll let you answer so we can squeeze more in. Thank you. Hi, Gavin. Thanks for your time. Um, my question is regarding what's happening across the pond. I know your conversation has been more UK-centric, but um, is it too early to predict the end of DEY, DEI, just with the Supreme Court judgment in the US that's a concern about whether um, people are not prematurely nailing the coffin for the old DEI that just recently okay. um, started? I'd like to get your optimistic perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So a very personal one and a political one. So it's belonging, the, sense of belonging. Does that lead the witness? Um, well, I, I have to, I mean, to be, you know, I'm flattered that you think that I've experienced as much outside a ship, that's a word I just made up, as, as you, because I'm born in London, so it's still home with, you know, you and stuff. So I think I would say that your experience is probably more challenging than mine, than mine was. Um, but for what, for what it's worth, uh, I, well, I, I do think that along the journey I've found like-minded people. And not many, so my circle is very small. And my inner circle, I should say, is very small. Uh, and it's based on values, less on background. Because I think values transcend everything. And if it was limited to background, then I think my life would be poorer um, and less rich than it, than it is. Uh, so I've been fortunate in that, in that sense. Um, uh, I guess the other thing, though, is that, and I said it was a superpower, which I said I would come back to. I don't know anyone that feels that they belong. Like, I'm not sure, like, anyone does. And you go to the, you know, go to the work, you know, you go into the workplace and you speak to the most successful people. They're just people. Like, they don't have any, like, you know, it's just, you know, amazing attributes that no one else has. They're stumbling along trying to figure it out themselves. And they have all the same doubts and concerns that, that, that we do. Um, so I do think there's an element of uh, maturity in understanding that many people feel that way. And actually, what can I do and learn from this? For me, it's liberating. As a young person, very difficult because you have this sense of alienation. As I've got an older, I've never felt like I've needed to fit into a box or a category, and I've managed to create my own. Um, and if I was speaking to a child, I think my response would be slightly different. But as I'm speaking to, obviously, um, uh, you know, someone who's obviously lived, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, I sound like one of those, like, but em embracing it is the only way that I've found to, to, to deal with it, if I'm honest. Um, and it's virtue. Beauty in the struggle, as they say. Um, and, and then on the, uh, and by the way, sorry, I should say, but I don't have all the answers to everything, by the way. I should say, <laughs> like, like, like <laughs> I don't know everything. So um, it's just an opinion. Um, but it's a death of Well, to anything to, I've said, you know, the disclaimer is it's just an opinion. I, I mean, I don't, I uh, can't confess to know, to, to, to know everything. Uh, I, and I think that backlash has happened here as well, let's be honest. Um, in the book, I do reference the US a lot. So the book starts with the you know, history of the finance, financial system that we're operating, both the city of London and Wall Street. Uh, I've had the fortune to travel a lot, a lot for work. And I talk about experiences in Australia, um, France, where my wife is from, uh, as far from places as Wales as well, where it was probably one of my first <laughs> business trips it was shocking, thinking that I was poor and then seeing like real poverty in South Wales. So, uh, but I do think there is a there is there is a backlash. Um, where do I see that? Where do I see that ending? Um, 
I honestly don't know. What I, what I hope is that the discussions that we are having change to understand that actually where that defense has come from is uh, a whole community feeling threatened themselves. So I think a lot of it is obviously politicized, but actually if you look forward um, and take the US, someone here was gonna know the date off the top of my head, I can't remember. I normally remember the date or like when, you know, in my book, I remember everything, but I can't remember this date. By a certain point in the US, it will be majority mixed or black other, something like that. And that is a real threat. But that's not the real issue. The real issue is that there are whole swathes of com communities that feel marginalized because they have to suffer from the same thing that many black communities do, which is inequality. They don't feel that they have any opportunity. And we see that here in the UK as well, um, particularly amongst young white men and boys in terms of there's this divergence between where different demographics are going and more extreme views amongst young boys because they feel alienated. Why do they feel alienated? Because they don't feel they have the opportunities. In actual fact, there is no difference to what many black, young black boys and girls experience and feel. It's just that it's manifested differently. So my, my wish and my hope would be that when we are having this discussion, we actually look at the root causes of it, um, not the manifestation of it. If we could do that, then actually both demographics and all other demographics would probably feel that they've got something to be optimistic about. Very final question. Can we go to the <laughs> top of the roof? <laughs> There's a guy there doing a Mexican wave in case you're Sorry, I'm yeah. blinded by the lights. No pressure. Hello, I'm Vanessa. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> Vanessa Sampaio. Um, quick question. I'm curious about you mentioning that you undertake coaching. Um, so what is the benefit of the coaching to you and at what stage did you start that? Um, so, uh, a question that I'm often asked, which wasn't asked, is, is uh, do you have, uh, what sponsors do you have, what mentors do you have on your journey? Get to uh, like, honestly, I didn't have, I had very, very few. I kind of had my wife to help me navigate all this, <laughs> like, honestly. Now, it just so happened that she's an exec coach, so she <laughs> like, so I'm just glad that's how you know. Uh, so she does it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think getting coaching from your wife is very different to getting it from a stranger, by the way. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I didn't. And the reason for that is because, I have to be honest, the first time I was given an exec coach, they were given their orders. And their orders were, Gavin is too, Gavin's a lot. Can you slow him down? Can you, seriously, can you slow him down? Can you tell him to take his time, can you tell him that uh, he needs to fit into us, not the other way around? And uh, like, I can't, like, I can't. And it was a horrible experience, if I'm honest. So I, I then resisted any, because that was experience of coaching that I had was that he wanted to change me. Um, and I'm never gonna fit into the mainstream, right? It's just not gonna, I'm always gonna be different. Uh, so I rejected any coaching. In terms of sponsors and mentors, again, I was told that, uh, why don't you get this person to mentor you or sponsor you? And I would often have a meeting and be like, yeah, probably not for me. Um, and I was then told that I'm, my standards are too high in terms of who would sponsor and mentor me. Uh, so I, I actually got to quite far without any of that. But I do realize now that if I'm gonna get to that next stage, then I need some help. So. I was very, very um, purposeful, intentional about who my coach would be. <clears throat> and it had to be, and I, the first session I sat there with my arms folded and went, last time I spoke to one of you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, uh, and I met a few, which I didn't have the opportunity to do before. And I have to say, the coach I have, they don't, coaching is not telling you what to do. Coaching is helping you come to the conclusion and answer your own questions yourself. And all the stuff I've said around brand and how I manage myself and fill in the gas tank, that's all from him because he's enabled me to think about it. And I would say it's a must have 
for me. In terms of sponsors, uh, they don't have to look like you. They don't have to come from the same background as you. In fact, I'd say it's probably better that they don't because they're a different voice in the room that you're not in advocating for you. And I've been very, very now intentional about finding and nurturing sponsors and making sure that they know my story and my narrative and enlisting them to my, to my journey. Um, and I would say I probably might have got further had I found that before, but I probably wasn't in the place to mm -hmm. uh, answer the question. Thank you for that. I, it's such a good message to end on because nobody travels this road alone. Um, and you know, you, you mentioned a lot of your support system around you. Um, I know there are still so many questions, but I'm mindful of time and I need to draw this to a close. And I do invite everyone to save your questions for our uh, drinks uh, and canapes session. Um, I want to thank you, Gavin, for um, well being here, but also being so vulnerable and authentic in um, everything you've shared with us and in how you wrote the book. Um, and I think in your book, at some point towards the end, you, you talk about how we should all own the solution when it comes to addressing inequalities in the workplace and in leadership. Um, you give some nice tangible examples of you know, organizations that have broadened their supply networks with black businesses or professionals who have taken the time to mentor um, a young person from an underprivileged background. Um, I think certainly we see universities as playing a part of the solution and our alumni networks integral to fulfilling that. Um, so perhaps it's fitting to end this conversation um, with a question and an invitation to everyone um, to um, contemplate and um, ask ourselves, what is it that I can do to open up opportunities? Um, and how can I use this event um, to connect, but also to give back? So thank you so much, Gavin. And Jason will say a few words. So first of all, thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Elena. Thank you all for, for being a wonderful, wonderful audience. Um, I appreciate that I'm here as a buffer between what was an amazing talk and drinks. So I will keep this as short as I possibly can. I've been given words. I'm going to sort of, you know, um, made them slightly shorter. So, so first of all, I, I want to sort of highlight that, that Gavin last year kindly agreed for us to use his journey, his story, as part of our, our graduation speech. So you know, last year, I, I was shaking hands, you know, shake many hands on stage. It, it, it's great, but you shake many hands. But, and often after this, the speech is something that I've heard many times before. Last year, I heard Gavin's talk. I thought it was inspirational. Sitting here today, I think it's even more inspirational. But it, it's actually inspirational, not necessarily for the reasons I expected it to be. And I, I've written down many words here, but, but ultimately, what I found extremely inspirational was, and I was touched by this, Gavin, the integrity, the openness, and the honesty that you've brought to the, the audience this evening, which I think really means that you're accessible as a role model. You really sort of emphasize what we all should aspire to do and ultimately align with the values we have at Queen Mary. And you know, for that, I personally am extremely grateful, and I, I'm sure you all are as well. So please, can we thank Gavin, and uh, then we can get drinks. Thank you.